Ooh. Hello my friends, my name is Artur Rey and I am an Estonian soldier and I am alive. God damn it, I'm alive. I'm alive and well. I'm well because of you guys. I had a demonetization, my whole channel was demonetized. And thanks to you guys, I've gotten back the monetization. YouTube re-monetized my channel. You guys wrote to YouTube, scares the channel, featured my story. You guys shared my story, you guys helped me in Patreon and thanks to you I've gotten my monetization back and I'm a happy man, let me tell you that, I'm a happy man. You guys have changed my life. To all of those who supported me in Patreon, you are heroes in my eyes, I will never forget and I'm always mentally sending good energy to you. If you want to support me, Patreon is the best way, the link is in the description below. My friends, it's too hot right now to actually wear my Adidas thing, so I'm wearing this. One of you guys sent me this shirt and I'm in my new apartment. This is my new place. I will be living here for the rest of my life, I think. This is my new bag, uh, you know. I will show you this closer. Actually, yeah, there are Rokia watches. Talking about Rokia, the wrist watch. Let's go. My friends, this is my new setup. I put up these shelves. Actually, this material left over from my kitchen, so I made this. I, I bought this change and I, I made this shelf system, and I think it looks pretty neat. And uh, the weapon is here. Can I show it in the video? Always in the background because I will get demonetized again. Don't want to do that. This is my degree, and um, this is the A10 Warthog bullet and um, play button. But actually, this is a sponsored segment. Let's not. Uh, Forget this. These are Rokia watches. Don't, don't mind the Black Rifle coffee. These are Rokia watches. And they are beautiful. Look at this. Ooh, what a pretty watch. And look at this one. Ooh, what a pretty watch. If you want one of those two watches, go in the link in the description below. It's Rokia. It's a Finnish watch company. They make incredible watches. I have two of them. They look beautiful. One of them has actually reindeer leather straps. Can you believe that? Reindeer, they are real, they do exist. And this is the one. This one has a metal strap. So go and get yourself a Rokia watch, I can vouch for it. And with this, we're ready to start the video. The Beast of Omaha. Oh, the Beast of Omaha, Beast. Omaha is the beach of D-Day, where American and Western forces, allied armies attacked the Third Reich. And Omaha was one of the bloodiest beaches. And they used MG42s on that beach, which is a very fast fire rate machine gun. In Estonian army, we use MG3s, which are based on MG42s, and I have heard how they shoot. It's like fast as hell. So yeah, if, if you can imagine a lot of people storming your way, and you just have an MG42 and just aim and shoot, that would be minced meat. And I think this story focuses on on that situation. Let's see what happened. Heinrich Severlo, the Beast Severlo. of Omaha. Mm. Stories from D-Day. Born in Metzingen, Germany, to a farming family in 1923, Heinrich Severlo was conscripted into the Wehrmacht at the age of 19 in 1942. According to his memoir, he was first stationed in Hanover with the 19th Light Artillery Division before being transferred to France in August 1942. There, he served with the 321st Artillery Regiment as a dispatch rider before being sent to the Eastern Front in December. In I was just about to say how lucky this dude was. Most of the German armed forces died in the Eastern Front or they had to go pass through the Eastern Front, which was the bloodiest front of the war. If you were in the Wehrmacht and you were lucky enough to stay your whole life in Germany defending the Western border or attacking France, you're good. The Eastern Front is where it's at. That's the, that's, nobody wants to go there. It's cold, cold, wet, bloody, violent. But yeah, he was sent in the Eastern Front, so I couldn't say that. He saw his part of the Soviet Union. December 1942, Severlo was reprimanded for making dissenting remarks and punished so severely that he spent six months in the hospital. He was sent home to his family farm before being recalled to military service once more. Severlo was sent to Brunswick, Germany in October 1943 for non-commissioned officer training, but was stationed with the 352nd Infantry Division after less than a month there. Severlo then went to Normandy, where he was stationed with 29 others in a German stronghold at Omaha Beach as Allied forces approached on June 6, 1944. He was in Widerstandsnest 62, or Resistance Nest 62, under the command of Lieutenant Bernhard Frerkeng, which was armed with artillery guns, rocket launchers, and machine guns. I mean, for, for me, 
they had these uh, resistance nests and all of these bunkers on top of the beaches. For me, it's it's a miracle Americans even took those beaches and Canadians and British and French soldiers. It seems impossible to attack something like that under a machine gun fire to take a stronghold tower. It seems like an impossible task to me, but the Western powers did it. In Omaha, it was the Americans, right? Canadians were in Sword and Juno, I think. The Beaches and British were in the other one. How the hell do you guys do it? It's a mystery to me. Zero 500 hours. The fog had faded away, and Severlo could see the assembled mass of enemy ships on the horizon. Then he heard a drone of bombers. Everyone in WN-62 jumped into a dugout or bunker as bombs rained down. However, they had missed their target, instead hitting the areas behind the strong points. Oof, no, no, no. Then after a short pause, the ships now opened fire, bombard- Okay, it answers my question. They bombed the hell out of the place, okay? The bombs missed, but then they had the ships with ha which have very heavy and big guns. Bigger than 150, I'm sure. That can take down a bunker. That's how they did it. They bombed the hell out of the Germans before they went in. Parting the shore. According to Severlo, thick, bright, gray chalk dust filled the air. Smoke and the dirt flying around blackened the sky, interspersed with flashing bolts of lightning. It seemed as if the whole world would disappear in the roaring, howling, and crashing inferno of exploding shells. Some of the men in WN-62 were only slightly wounded, but none were killed. As Severo looked up and returned to his MG-42 machine gun, he saw 48 landing craft getting closer to the beach. Ooh. According to Severo, he and his fellow German troops received orders from Lieutenant Berhard Ferking to fire when the enemy was knee-deep in the water and still unable to run quickly. As the American soldiers waded in the water, the order was given, and all at once, the mortars, machine guns, and field guns opened fire causing panic among the first enemy wave. Many saw cover behind the tank obstacles. Severo opened fire with the MG-42 machine gun at the American troops. He was fed ammunition by a soldier he didn't know. He recalled one of his shots as it struck an American soldier in the head. First, the steel helmet fell off, then his chin fell on his chest. Severo watched as the- Yeah, you can see the iron plate Americans wore. These plates were supposed to take the bullet, but if you're hit in the head, back then American helmets weren't bulletproof. Nowadays, it's a different story. American marine helmets can even stop a Draguno sniper bullet if it comes from long enough distance. 9mm, it definitely stops. But back then it was just a metal helmet. Didn't stop anything, except for mortar tiny splinters. The water sprayed up where the machine gun bursts had landed, and when the small fountains came closer to the GIs, they threw themselves down. Very soon, the first bodies were drifting in the waves of the rising tide. He aimed slightly beyond the dark shapes that were the corpses of GIs as more men drifted in the tide behind them. In a short time, the Americans down there had been taken down. Severlo claimed he fired his machine gun for nine straight hours, firing around 12,000 rounds. He only took breaks to reload or to let the weapon- 12,000 rounds, nine hours. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly long amount of time. And let me tell you, if MG42 and with that fire rate, you will have to change the barrel every 300 rounds or so. One box is 100 or 50 or 100 or 200 rounds. And then they have to change the box and you know, the, the belt that fits the bullets. And if you do three boxes or three belts, then you have to change the barrel because it's, it's burning red and you cannot shoot otherwise it will deform. So you have to change the barrel. That happens pretty fast so they had to go through I think many many barrels usually switch between first and second barrel you switch and the other one cools off but if you shoot like that with no brakes the other barrel cannot cool down and you have to use the third barrel so they had many many barrels for this weapon and a lot of bullets to fire that nine hours straight five minutes is enough to know this weapon it's, it's crazy how many people did he kill this dude is surely in hell cannot there's, there's no other way. Weapon cooled down. While reloading, one or two Americans would take the opportunity to move closer, only to be shot down by one of the other gunners in the bunker. As his MG-42 cooled down, Severlo fired a rifle instead. Yeah. After his regular ammo ran out, he used rounds intended for anti-aircraft fire where every fifth round was a tracer round. This led to his detection by the USS Frankfurt and he was fired upon. 
He took cover just in time before the shells could hit him. Although shrapnel. Yeah, the tracer rounds. You can see them very far away. And fire on tracers. In our infantry um, tactics, we use this code follow tracer tracer to show where the enemy is. For example, Yoguix Yelgi Trasserit. That means squad one follow tracer. You shoot the tracer, they see where the enemy is. You know why you have to do this in the Estonian military? Is because we're in the forest. Every tree looks the same. If you're saying to the enemy is behind that tree, nobody's gonna know. If you use the clock method, right? Three o'clock, 100 meters in front. People 100 meters to the left, they cannot see what three o'clock, 100 meters to the front is. If you say follow my tracer, everybody's gonna see that burning red bullet going through the air and they're gonna focus their fire there. Even if they don't see the enemy, their goal usually or the machine gunner's goal is to, you know, push down the enemy. Firing on the area, you know, enemy cannot pull up his head and squad two is attacking from the side. Follow tracer, that's the only thing we did with the tracer. But here he used the tracer's bad idea. No had hit his face. His gun was damaged and finally rendered useless. Its hot barrel had even caused a small grass fire. The shells were now causing havoc on their position, and some U.S. soldiers were getting closer to his position. It was time to get out of there. Ferking shook Severlo's hand and ordered him to retreat. Severlo and his fellow Germans retreated from the bunker, and they all took cover from the American gunfire. Only himself and another German soldier, Kurt Wernicke, made it. When Wernicke got to Severlo, he told him Ferking had been shot in the head. Together, they reached the nearby village of coville sur where their battalion HQ was, and Severlo received medical care. The Germans, including Severlo, surrendered to American troops on June 7, 1944. Next day. Next day. Severlo was sent to Boston, Massachusetts, as a prisoner of war, before being sent to England in 1946, where he worked as a forced laborer until March 1947. Severlo then returned to Germany to his family's farm. You're a lucky man in Germany if you get to surrender to British, French or the Americans because you were sent to America, you were sent to Britain. Altogether, you were away two years, uh, three years, 44 to 47, three years you're away and you're fed and treated nicely. Well, what happens if you surrender to the Soviet Union? If you're an officer, you will be shot. If you're a private, you will be deported to the Gulag system where you have to work in minus 30, minus 30 Celsius and you will die of starvation of, or from freezing. And some of those people, some of those soldiers, I would say some of them got home 10 years later. Most of them didn't, most of them died. So yeah, if I was in the Wehrmacht, I would try my best to surrender to the Americans because the Russians, they didn't fun around. They were there to kill Germans through work camps or through bullets, it doesn't matter. My great grandfather was deported to uh, Gulag. He was worked to death there. He was as big as me, even bigger. He was like six foot five, you know, a giant man. Well fed, big man. And he was worked to death in eight months. Didn't take him in three years, and this guy got home. So yeah, he's lucky. In 1960, Severlo contacted American veteran chaplain David Silva, who had been shot three times at Omaha Beach. The men met several times, and their story is featured in a documentary by Alexander Chogala about their unusual friendship, Path of Forgiveness, a long way back to Omaha Beach. Oh my God. Severlo's memoir, WN62, A German Soldier's Memories of the Defense of Omaha Beach, Normandy, June 6, 1944, was published in the year 2000. Severlo claimed that he took out more than 1,000 men, most likely more than 2,000. There is no way to substantiate Severlo's assertions, and many historians doubt their validity. Imagine you have to live, you will live. I don't know why or how, but most of those Nazi soldiers somehow, they live over 90 years old. We have some of them left and they are quite old. This dude here has to live with this knowledge. He has killed so many people. I mean, I know, I've never killed anybody. Big, big, big surprise there, but uh, you go to war, you have to kill, and the first kill is the hardest, they say. And after that, it's just uh, a number. 2,000. It is just a number, but it's a very big number. You can't even imagine what it is to live with that. The dude must be afraid of death. He knows what he's done if he believes in anything. In every religion, it's like, don't kill, don't do it. And he has done it so much, and he's going to die. What's going to happen to him? I think he thinks a lot about it. He thought a lot about it before he died. Validity. The total U.S. casualties at Omaha Beach were between 1,900 and 3,000. Heinrich Severlo became known as the Beast of Omaha, but this was only given to him by the post-war media. Severlo was actually deeply haunted by his actions. Oh, yeah. That he had a duty to Lieutenant Freking. 
for Severlo's claims to be accurate, he would have been responsible for most of the casualties at Omaha Beach. Historians don't doubt his significance in the event, nor do they question the effectiveness of the machine guns on Omaha Beach, but no exact totals for one lone gunner can be known. Severlo would die in Lockendorf, Germany in 2006 at the age of 82. 82, that's a long-lived life. It's an insane story of an insane man. It's an... Right, that is the 6th of June when this happened. He surrendered on the 7th. So one day before he surrendered and everything was over, the Nazi regime was over for him, he kills 2,000 people. If he had been anywhere else, he wouldn't have been able to do that. I think he have, has thought about this. How many things could have been different? He could have been signed elsewhere and just surrendered. But no, he was in that outpost, in, behind that machine gun. And he was probably one of the last machine guns to fire that day. And the longest firing machine gun. And probably the most kills made by one machine gun. He was behind that weapon. My friends, this video got kind of deep. This is existential stuff I'm talking about here. It's really tough to think about this stuff, especially with depression. So let's not harm ourselves. I know many of you guys have PTSD because of battles, because of deployment. Many of you have just depression. I don't want to harm you. Let's all be happy. Thank you for being back. I will try to make more videos. I am actually really busy right now because I'm performing a lot with my band. Since uh, YouTube fell away, my mm, YouTube revenue has gone really down. I don't know why. What, I, what is going on? Well. I've been doing more stuff with my band to survive and uh, new patrons are really helping me out but uh, that's why I'm busy, I'm, I'm performing, I'm actually have two weddings at the start of July in a row, boom, so yeah, that's the life of a musician. But my friends, thank you so much for watching, thank you for being you, thank you to the patrons and to the future patrons and as always, until my next video, stay cool and bye bye.